podcast episode 39 this talks caravan coast flag manager of baseball analytics co-host drinking a mystery white cloth flavor and the mystery is that it's tangerine i just thought it's a <laughs> badass flavor i don't know i was gonna do something more cute with you guys guessing not, not much but, of a mystery uh, between right now so so uh lindley sports engineer take it away what's up kyle lindley sports engineer driving baseball drinking a georgetown lucille ipa and I'm Anthony Brady, sports scientist, biomechanist, primary host of the Driveline Research and Drinks podcast, episode 39. Today I've got uh, I've got the Rubens Hop Tropic, which uh, found this weekend, but pretty fire, dude. It's it's up there on my Rubens list now. Almost got that one last time I was there. And today with us we have Eric Jaegers, uh, manager, pitching manager of uh, technical development. I drive on baseball and minor league pitching coordinator for the Cincinnati Reds. Inventor uh, of the baseball phenomenon known as pitch design. The first <laughs> ever yeah. to do pitch so, design. He also invented uh, laminar flow, seam shifted <laughs> wake. Um, yeah, I think I saw his name get, get name dropped in a couple articles. Fellow 2017 intern with your boy and Anthony. True. 2016 uh, trainee. Left-handed, you know, 99.9 mile an hour pull downs off the crossbar into his eye. Oh no way! What? Yeah, first ever I first ever time pulling down. I think uh, I think probably two of those six or seven things you said were true. So I'll let the crowd kind of decide what they want. To <laughs> but to be clear, inventor of pitch design is true. Yeah, that's one but of the I'll, true. I'll introduce myself as a lucky acquaintance of these three smart individuals. Oh, oh. Nice, yeah. Oh, yeah, also, uh, Jake's is, uh, he's drinking a Presidente light, um, which that's is actually, right. Courtesy of Kyle Bodie, who brought in Presidente to instructs and had some very happy coaches for the Reds. Also known <laughs> as a dirty, wet sock. That's uh, flavor equivalent. That's awesome. Jager's in town for the off season. That's right. Yeah. I thought it was happy only to right to, to do my video in a closet. Um, you know, as an ode to Alex Caravan um, and, and all the members of R&D for Driveline. Nice. I'm very excited to be back. Nice. That's right. 
pretty pretty so, exciting start to the off season too. Um, with with Trevor winning a Cy Young, as we all know, could not have done it without you. You basically made <laughs> Trevor into the pitcher that he is today. I know he attributes all of his success to you. So that that had to be pretty cool, right? Yeah, I was I was really fortunate, or I, you should say I should say uh, he was really fortunate yes. <laughs> to run into me before the season. I could say a couple things to him that exactly. certainly paved the way for him to take the Cy Young. Yes, um, you know, not really all of the work he did leading up to this, all of the uh, things he did that were thought to be outlandish and ridiculous in training and everything. Uh, the culmination of years of hard work, none of that. But yeah. uh, I did say a few things that I think really helped him out. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was kind keys. of like knocking on the door and then all it took was a couple conversations with you that really brought him over the hump into okay. Cy Youngdom. I, I sent out the special giveaway, by the way, and the very slight chance that, um, you know, there's anyone here that hasn't already seen my tweet that I just sent out two seconds ago. Um, whoever <laughs> retweets my tweet, We'll get a we'll, we'll, no, 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 not whoever enrolled. retweets your tweet. Jesus, what? <laughs> he just we're just giving him away. Yeah, not yeah, yeah, not yeah, whoever retweets, retweets your tweet. Yeah, so. One person, one person, no, dude, whoever, who whoever, bro, all everyone. <laughs> and there you have it, and writing boys. Okay, uh, no. no, yeah, one person out of out of everyone who retweets my tweet, um, who will be chosen by a random number generator on camera, will get a special pitch design certification. Which, which uh, I, I think I think that's a that's a good way to kind of lead into just how like just Jake's, Jake's experience in pitch design and oh. how that's kind of come about. Also to be clear though, you- the winner will be chosen tomorrow at 4 PM Pacific. So list of people that retweet caravans tweet will be entered in for the free pitch oh. design course. And we already have a couple of retweets dog. Got my boy, Robert Frey in the house. <laughs> oh geez. Let's go. Uh, go but anyways, I, I, I was going to say like, yeah, we, we toss out pitch design a bunch, and obviously it's one of the core concepts at Driveline that's pushed a bunch of, like, you know, pushed revenue interest for us, got a bunch of pro players interested. Uh, Jake, do you want to c- kind of talk about what, like, pitch design was when you first started messing around with it and how that led to us eventually doing a pitch design cert and it becoming, like, a more popular staple of a lot of, like, you know, big league staffs and everything? And when you yeah. invented it, mainly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I'll hop in the way back machine here. Um, and, and we'll go back to probably around 2014 when I was just introduced to like driveline methodology, our, our college, my junior college coach had seen Kyle speak, uh, at an event. I want to say it was probably a coach's boot camp at the Texas baseball ranch. Uh, and he had brought training modalities such as wrist weight, shoulder tube, weighted balls, et cetera. Um, and I really had no idea who Kyle was or what driveline was, um, until later, So I'm diving into the YouTube channel. I then see, you know, uh, Kyle's acquainted with Trevor Bauer and dive into Trevor's YouTube channel. And then I stumble upon a video that I want to say was posted in December of 2013 uh, that uh, I love giving, giving credit to this because it's, it's very dearly due. Um, But it's, it's like pitch design. It's just labeled pitch design, December, whatever of 2013. So like, I mean, we're talking nearly eight years ago, you know what I mean? Like and that was on Bowers or, or Driveline's yeah, YouTube? on Trevor's YouTube channel. Um, so I don't know if you guys want to post a link or whatever, but I think everyone should watch that. Uh, I remember watching it and just not having any idea what he was talking about. Like I wasn't trained to pick up spin access on video. So whatever he was saying, I was kind of just taking at face value and basically thinking this is like a master's level course in pitching in yeah. I'm in elementary school. Right. Um, and I think it kind of goes, it went like in one ear and out the other. It was just another video that I watched. It was like, okay, yeah, this, this guy's doing some, some wild stuff here. Um, and then you go back and watch it now and it's like, Oh my God, <laughs> you know, like you can't believe how yeah. ahead of his time he truly was. Um, but I think that is, is then the segue into where I got involved at driveline which is, yeah, probably in the 2016 as a trainee when, when Rap Soto sort of came on the scene, um, but then heading into the 2017 offseason to where <clears throat> Tyke Green was still working at Driveline, and he was basically Bauer's personal assistant, uh, much as I guess that relationship sort of exists <laughs> now. But it was a very special 
uh, like circumstance or scenario where the edgertronic camera would come out and it was kind of like everybody stood 20 feet back and it's like, I'm not getting near that camera. That thing is worth more than I am. Um, There was cords everywhere. There was like no sort of wireless routers or anything that made it uh, more seamless. So it's like, hey, if you're in the weight room, like you better not step on that Ethernet cord. Yeah. Otherwise, like you're going to mess up Bowers training. Tyke's going to kill you, like all this stuff. Yeah. So um, I think everybody kind of steered clear of what they were doing. And it was like this, you know, secret, super high level operation. So uh, where I sort of came in was trying to get that out to the masses and, and learn from what Trevor is doing, which I would consider to be the gold standard of training and bring that to all of our in-house trainees. Um, and I I think it's kind of a funny story of how it started because I didn't know how to operate the camera. Like I said, it was truly only Taiki who would, who would ever do this. Um, by the way, by the way, not not to cut you off. I was gonna say, since you dropped him a couple of times, we'll we'll be, we'll be the next guest. We'll we'll be the next guest. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Trevor Uh Bowers assistant will be the next guest on the podcast. (laughs) Uh, I was planning on introducing him like that next week. Yeah, no, uh, a a much smarter individual than I am. It'll be a much better interview. I'm sure. But, uh, (laughs) So I worked up the courage to ask Kyle if I could take the Edgertronic camera out to a UW game and just mess around and whatever. And mind you, there are the cameras that are used on the market are SC1s typically. So it's the base model of Edgertronic camera. Now, Edgertronic had given us a camera on Lend, which was the SC2X. So typically an Edgertronic camera will run like five, six grand. This camera was, I want to say like 18 to 20 grand. So I'm taking this thing out. I have no idea what I'm doing. I've never used an external battery pack to power a camera. And I I literally don't know how to use it. And I just asked Kyle, like I slack him and I say, hey, uh, would I be able to take the camera out? I I want to kind of just learn how to use it. And I'm just going to film some stuff at the, the Washington baseball game. And he said something along the lines of like, yeah, sure. If you blow the fuse, I'm going to kill you. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't even know what that means. Like, what, <laughs> what is that? So long story short is there's variable like wattage and voltage outputs uh, that you can use, and it should be set on 12 volts to power the camera. And if you go on 20, you run the risk of potentially blowing a fuse. Mm. So a few Google searches later, I, I felt a little bit more at ease and I went to the game and I think I took probably the worst footage of all time. <laughs> uh, I had to figure out like what the pre-trigger was, where to p- have the settings. I think everything I took was out of focus. It's completely dark. Didn't know what the aperture ring was or how to use it and everything. But uh, sort of just cut my teeth on on figuring it out and taking a bunch of L's and, and making some really horrible video and then figuring out, okay, this is how to operate the camera. And then this is how we'll, we'll use it in gym and things. So um, I think that's sort of um, a roundabout way of answering how I got introduced was just watching Trevor operate from afar mm-hmm. um, and knowing that we we absolutely needed to do what he was doing on a larger scale. Right. What, uh, I, was what, gonna, I was gonna say, what what are like, how did you come up with like the deliverable uh, like thing that you would give to the athletes and when did that come about? Because honestly, my first introduction to you was obviously in 2017, we were both interning. You were a strength intern um, and also training. Get that. People forget yeah, that. Yeah. Just, I, I, I forgot that myself, dude. I didn't know that. Just uh, just throwing gas, just going psycho on the on the mound uh, for live ABs and everything, uh, which was which was fun to watch. And so, like, uh, later on, uh, my only perception was that. And then I started seeing you because I went back to school and I was seeing you on Twitter all the time with the uh, – uh, release point edutronic footage. So like, how did you get to that? Like final deliverable? Because I feel like you kind of expanded that and really use that to like help make guys better and make that a process for, for like bullpens. P- p- paved the way I would even say a, a pioneer in uh social media, popularized black and white edutronic clips is, <laughs> yes. uh, is, is what I'm going to try to push for it to be written on your tombstone, dog. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No, and, and I really should give credit to Taiki here as well. Um, a talk that he gave, it was a, a weekly sort of employee continued education talk at a, a company meeting. And what he said stuck with me. And it was when you want to produce content, like don't wait for it to be perfect. Mm-hmm. Get it out and iterate over and over again. And if you wait for the perfect moment, like it, it just doesn't exist. And you're going to post like twice a year. 
So it doesn't have to be perfect, but put it out and be a regular source of information to where people expect they're going to get something from you and then you deliver it over and over and over again, right? So like, you know how many people are just waiting for this puppy to come out on Mondays. And if you stopped and you didn't do that, you know, then they're, they're not a regular customer anymore. They don't expect it from you. Right. But um, I, I think that's where the deliverable came from was uh, trying to publish what we were doing. So uh, again, like when I first started posting things, I didn't exactly know what we were doing and, and we didn't have these awesome, very specific pitch targets that we want to go to with everything, um, have a very clear roadmap for development. But we generally knew that we wanted to make, you know, not great pitches a little bit better and that we, we generally knew how pitches moved and, and where we could sort of go and learn from really elite examples. Um, so I think that's kind of where it started. And obviously now we're, we're much further along and we have a crazy amount of resources. Um, but but uh, I, again, on the process side of things and a deliverable to an athlete. I think that's the same thing of like watching Trevor from afar. So like, how does he operate? What's the process? Well, okay. It's using the camera and then spending an hour or two after the session, reviewing the clips um, or spending time with the edgertronic airplane on a TV and reviewing clips pitch after pitch to sort of make these adjustments. So piecing that puzzle together and then figuring out a system that can um, you know, get that out to athletes and, and, and make progress is, I guess, what I was after. So it was just about, okay, how can I do what one person's doing and, and scale that out larger to, to all our guys and then have our coaches do the same thing with that process and do it to all their guys. And now we have this big web um, effect sort of a thing. So at what point I, I was going to say, oh, sorry, I was just going to say kind of to wrap up, to, to finish off the initial very broad open ended question I asked you was what, what went so post that process what kind of went into boiling everything down into the the product that that i tweeted about the pitch design certification like what what what's kind of what's kind of behind the scenes process of building that and how do you see that in the landscape of all the available educational resources there are yeah i think that was learning like what what we're after like what are these targets what do really good pitches move like so you know, it's a huge kudos to the R&D team. I, I know you, Daniel Coyne, like have done crazy amounts of research. Now, Christian Hook, uh, we should, we're probably indebted to, to David Howell and, and people who have come and gone and things like that as well. But um, research into like what the best pitches are and how they in fact do move so that we know where we're going. I think really early on, it was like, okay, Bauer threw his curveball on Rapsodo. Like generally we know that's a good pitch, right? So it's like, all right, everybody throw your curveball like that. Yeah. Um, but we've learned now that there's many more variables that go into that equation. And I think that's kind of where that stuff um, led into creating a certification is like, hey, we have a really good idea of what the best pitches move like. And we have a really good idea of what these common issues tend to be. So a little bit of that was like the applied process of just working with guys is finding out what these common issues are. So, oh yeah, a lot of guys throw a slider that that lacks horizontal break, um, mm -hmm. at least at the lower levels. Or hey, a lot of guys throw a curveball that it really doesn't curve that much. Um, a lot of guys cut the heater a little bit, things like that, yeah. so that we can, I guess, bucket these sort of issues and then create solutions um, and processes for that. Yeah. I was going to ask when sort of like, you said it, it started with messing with the camera and, and using the edgertronic, but I guess at one point did it go a little more quantitative in terms of like looking at Rapsoda data, pitch tracking metrics? Because thinking back to 2017, when like Lindley and I would, would track those like baseline bullpens, we didn't include anything in terms of like axis efficiency, horizontal or vertical break. It was mainly just spin rate, right, Lindley? I think we like sometimes when, when efficiency was available, I like sometimes wrote it down, but it was yeah. never, <laughs> it was yeah. never consistent or anything. We never really, we didn't really know what it was. It was mainly just like spin rate uh, at the time, mm -hmm. not even, mm -hmm. you know, like access or, or break profiles kind of a thing. So the transition into like using the qualitative stuff, working with the cameras to like, Oh, you know, we can mine a lot of information from understanding Right. What horizontal and vertical break is kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's a good point. And it's kind of just like where the technology was geared towards. So early on, like driveline had a track man unit right inside in 2016. And if you remember, 
what was displayed on the TV was like velocity and spin rate. Yeah. So like, that's kind of all we were going off exactly. of, um, was, Oh, do you spin it high or not? Right. And there was a couple individuals, I won't name them. I don't want to embarrass them, but they were the, the spin rate gods, right? Like they could oh, yeah. spin the heck out of it. And now, right. We know, well, they were probably just around the ball. It wasn't flush. Yeah. It wasn't like they had crazy ride on the ball, but they could sure spin it. Yeah. And it was sort of this like unknown of how that exists. Why does that happen? Uh, all these things. And then it's just like this inherent skill. You either can or can't spin it. Right. Maybe some of that is still true. Uh, but like you said, we've been able to peel the, l- the layers of the onion back a ton and learn, you know, that there's like four or five, six layers of complexity on top of just yeah. spin by itself. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think on the more quantitative side, like where we, where we got there was just realizing, okay, like here's the rap Soto interface, which I think was instrumental for that. And it has, you know, the short form break. So then it's like, okay, you're here. Um, and at this time too, what I should note is like pitch FX is alive and kicking, yeah. um, you know, and, and it's been going on since whenever they installed it with like Oh seven in the playoffs or Oh six. I forget what it was. Um, Your engine too, dude. Don't for, you'll forget pitch <laughs> FX was kicking an engine as well. That's right. It was pick up cause it can pick up anything. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, I don't know if I would say it was alive and kicking, but she was, kicking. <laughs> Uh, it was squirming. <laughs> right. So I think that's kind of where curiosity then took over. And it was like, okay, here's, you know, athlete X who came in and had this profile or whatever. Like, let me dig into Brooks baseball or um, a site that has this publicly available data and see how, you know, some of the best pitchers in baseball, what their stuff moves like. Yeah. And it's then connecting the dots of like, uh, okay, well, Brooks is reporting from 40 feet, like rap sodas from 55, like all this stuff and that, that again, you're just adding sort of on and, and then gaining a better understanding. Um, and then building our own tools on top of that to sort of act as a, um, interpretation tool. Mm-hmm. But I think that's where it kind of started was like, okay, we realize we have this more information. We now realize we have these publicly available sources. Uh, what can we sort of like learn and piece together? How much of that did you do uh, at your time in Iowa? Because I know they have a big, we've talked about before, they have a big student student manager group mm-hmm. um, and they, they are like big into the analytics. Um, but did you work with them a lot when you were, when you were there? Or was that uh, not quite a thing yet? Yeah. Yeah. So it was a very short stay at Iowa, um, but I certainly did have interactions with them. And I think really when I was there in the fall of 17, it was, in the infancy, it was just kind of like picking up steam for them. Uh, I think a majority of their efforts were focused on game planning, advanced reporting, um, prepping for series and things like that. Not as much player development focused. Uh, Trying to go when and, I uh, had, win games at Wichita. Yeah. NBC World yeah, Series. That's right. When when I had gotten there, we were collecting Rap Soto data. Um, and it's sort of where I had gotten hurt and then I began prepping the rap Soto and, and running the iPad during sessions and things like that. Uh, but again, I, I remember very vividly, like just trying to get someone's slider to like 0% efficiency mm-hmm. because that's what we thought was like the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, so it's really funny, but they, they had a Sony RX 1000 Mark IV, um, RX 100, 1000, one of the two, uh, but a, a high speed camera variant. Um, but hadn't had an edgertronic yet. Um, weren't really sure where we were housing the data or using it or knowing where to go, but just generally like knew it was a good idea to use it. Mm-hmm. And I think later on then, and it's a it, you know, to, to Jake Stone, Sam Bornstein, Adam Shuck, uh, Ryan Gorman, those guys really just took it to another level and just put their heads together and tried to create a system of sorts for, for how to organize, store yeah. and distribute this data. Um, and then train up their staff. And like you said, man, they have a monster now. Like that thing is just churning out like dudes from an analyst standpoint, churning out incredible information to the players. And it's really, really special to see what they have there. Um, so hat tip to, to Rick Heller and co. Um, what they've built there is really, really special. And I need to for sure give a shout out to Desi Drushel, who's now the Yankees, but yeah. was the pitching coach when I was there who was really, really instrumental in, in getting this thing started and empowering the managers um, to be a part of that team and, and to realize how vital they were to, to those processes. Yeah. And, and yeah, also shout out to Desi, always a man of uh, many bananas. So that, that, that always pairs well. 
I, I've I've often been around Desi at a conference and, and needed a snack, and he's always been come through with a banana or a banana peel. That but any, <laughs> uh, I, I was gonna I was gonna pivot a little bit if you guys are down to uh, talk, talk about Bauer. Uh, obviously, Trevor just just won the Cy Young. Uh, we're all really pumped. Um, you're extremely close to you were extremely close to him in general, but also this last year. Uh, I, I know we kind of we, we kind of talked about this off air, but I was wondering if you wanted to kind of go into detail on one of the stories you told me and Anthony um, going into spring training. You guys were like coming up with fun, fun competitions to kind of motivate the all the all the Reds pitchers, and uh, and I think I think Trevor won one of them that you came up with. So you have the I think you have the secret sauce to a Cy Young Award winner. <laughs> one to is one. What I think you were trying to say. Yeah, yeah. No, I I can certainly do that. So. Um, I guess how this sort of starts is Caleb Cotham and I, who he's the current assistant pitching coach of the Reds, are trying to come up with some systems to create competition heading into summer camp, so spring training 2.0, um, and really just a means of, of getting the guys to, to be loose and compete with each other and get the juices flowing before the season starts. Hey, by the way, by the way, really quick question, uh, kind of naive by myself, but is this like something that's common? Like do, do pitchers usually – are pitchers like open to kind of like fun games like that or or most people like more like bit like you know business is business let's just like get innings get my arm loose like how how is introducing like those games and setups to begin with yeah no i think guys generally like to you know throw down side bets and money you always see in bullpens like you know going ten dollars for a spot or whatever and i think like it's true for all ages right you throw up a leaderboard or you throw up some sort of competition and guys thrive in it um, I think maybe it's just often overlooked because it's a little extra work and there's a lot of things going on. So it's easy to not do. Um, but it was something that, that DJ, um, our, our big league pitching coach felt very strongly about that Caleb felt strongly about that. I was obviously super on board with, um, that we wanted to train this sort of compete factor, um, and, and act as a primer for the season. So, um, I think it's, like I said, something that our group felt strongly about and wanted to make sure that we did. So uh, this the sort of system is just like, you know, things that we like or, or value highly on a on an at bat level um, that, that we're going to award points for and then dock you, you know, if bad things happen. Right. So if you walk a guy or you give up a home run or like hard contact, whatever, uh, you're losing points and then you're gaining points or you're awarded points, you know, for good things like swings and misses, called strikes, winning even counts and whatever else. So um, that's the sort of basis of it. And we were able to create a competition that was just, you know, the, basically the king of pitching, um, king of FAH is, is what we called it. So we told the guys, uh, you know, we got a WWE belt and it was like, Hey, this is going to the winner. Here's how the system works. Um, we're going to grade this out after, after every event and we'll post the leaderboard daily. And then at the end, you know, the winner gets a little bit of, uh, you know, to gloat a little bit, to wear the belt around, say I'm the man kind of a thing, but where it comes into Trevor then, is he won it. So, um, you know, it was really cool for our minor league pitchers, especially who are staying in contact with to watch how Trevor competed early on in the season and then how he sustained it to tell these guys like, Hey, listen, this is the winner of the competition. Um, you know, and he's the best pitcher in baseball yeah. right now. Right. Right. In the national league. It's pretty, pretty um, good validation so, for that system. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Not pretty bad. easy to, to kind of show, but that was the whole basis was like, listen, you know, there's going to be things out of your control that are going to happen, right? You're, you're not going to always have the best outing, but if you do these things really well and you score really highly on this system, you're probably going to be in a pretty good spot. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so that's kind of what it was um, on the base level. We did things from a in-game standpoint, like I said, at the, at that level, and then things um, from a bullpen perspective, so a little just system is called call your shot, which is exactly what it sounds like. You pick where you're going to go and you get awarded points uh, if you hit the spot or not. Um, but just little things to make guys go against each other and compete against themselves. I think that's what we were after. Yeah. Um, and we found pretty good success using it. And and then, you know, like you said, uh, really cool validation to just watch Trevor do really well after doing that yeah. um, and then take home the hardware at the end of the season. Yeah, that's, that's, really cool. that, that's actually like a really good point too because uh, I, I could totally see myself in something like that, like being worried about the uh, like 
quality of the system. And I think you mentioned this as mm-hmm. well, that you were kind of worried like, oh shit, like, is this going to work? You know, yeah. is, is this even going to play out kind of a thing? And at some, at, like at some levels, having something to at least start with and say the system like was really crappy, the competition didn't work. At least you could iterate on it and you would know, you know, right. um, so it's almost like worth like implementing and testing and just like going with it, uh, like right away kind of a thing. Right. No, that's, that's exactly right. And I think like, I certainly did have those, uh, you know, thoughts come up and there were certainly people that, that didn't like the system, uh, you know, in, in its entirety and had some qualms or whatever. Right. Um, but it's, so it's like, Hey, you know, like this really penalizes pitchers who give up early contact, but still get an out. And it's like, right. But so does great American ballpark, right? You give up a bunch <laughs> of contact there and like, it's a little bit of a tough spot. So, um, that that's kind of like the thing. And, and it goes back to like churning out things and, and, and iterating on it. Right. So if I were to make that again, uh, you know, they're, they again, I worked on it with Caleb. I, I don't want to say I completely made the system. Um, he, he developed a ton of it, but it's, we would do things a little different. We would have maybe a different scoring system, um, maybe add or subtract some of the, the metrics that are in there. Um, but yeah, what it was about was creating a competition, not creating the perfect scoring system. Yeah. And was it, was it mostly, this is kind of specific, but was it mostly outcome based measures or was it like, um, like, could you, could you gear it towards like, if you're trying to do pitch design, for example, and you're trying to like change a pitch, Mm -hmm. like you guys can like change the, change the scoring system based on some like pitch characteristic or like ball flight characteristic that you're shooting for. Yeah, no, it was, it was definitely uh, really outcome based. I, I will say though, like, you know, if it's different if you give up a double OO, right, without getting any sort of called strike, swing and miss, anything like that, as opposed to getting deeper in account where you did get a called strike, you got a miss, you got to like O2 or 1 2, and then you gave up a double. Mm-hmm. Um, you're getting rewarded for things inside that, that as well. Um, so I would say it's a mix and match of both, but certainly the focus was to be in competition mode mm-hmm. and to like dominate. And, and that was again, like the, the, re- the rationale behind doing this as a primer to the season. Yeah. Right. That makes sense. W- weren't you telling me it, c- it came down to like, uh, Trevor had <laughs> Trevor just like nailed this spot, like 15 pitches in a row or, or what, what, yeah. Yeah, what was the, what was the grand finale? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's far and away, I think the best bullpen that I've ever witnessed that I've ever seen Trevor throw that I've ever seen really anyone throw. Uh, but he was, I want to say either second or third in the standings and he had one bullpen left. That was it. And he needed a perfect score. So, uh, it came down to his last 10 throws. There's, uh, 13 points possible, three bonuses, and he had to hit every single one. And he did exactly that. It was remarkable. So whoever was catching did not move their glove one time. And it was, it was truly remarkable. I sat there just like jaw on the floor, like, Oh my goodness. Like, yeah, he's, he's pretty good at this. Um, but then ended up like taking home the hardware for it. And of course he let everybody know about it. I think the Indians came to town. There's a picture of him on Twitter, just wearing the belt around, letting everybody know, you know, that he was the King and all that. So yeah, it was, it was cool. How confident were you going? Were you, um, and I mean, I saw you like five minutes before this happened, but how confident were you going into the awards announcement that, that Trevor was going to win Cy Young? Yeah, I was, I was pretty confident, I think, especially given that like he had a pretty commanding lead in, in terms of the base level stats, like ERA. ERA, um, yeah. ERA and whip, I think. Yeah. He, he was, he was by far a lot, um, yeah. you know, when it comes down to, to the voters and such. Um, so I, I was pretty confident and I know <laughs> Brady saw some odds, crazy odds that he was like this heavy underdog. So I wish I would have gotten those and, yeah. uh, you know, I see those prior, but pretty ridiculous that he was whatever it was like plus 800 or something. Yeah. I, I think, I think I was in September. I actually, actually, I was kidding myself too. I looked at it yeah. later. I found, uh, I found some odds before where, where Trevor was like a favorite, but, but I mean, I oh, mean really? the, the way the votes came out, I, I couldn't believe he won 90%. Because mm-hmm. for me, honestly, maybe it's just like me being a. What was like, it? Was it like twenty-seven out of thirty or something? Twenty-seven out of thirty, yeah. Uh, and, and, and like I don't know, I just feel like he's gone unlucky before. You know, he had a, he had a he right. had a chance like two years ago. Obviously, got hurt, missed like thirty innings, maybe. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I was gonna say, I mean, like I, I thought it was gonna be, I thought it was gonna be fairly close. You you had him on a couple stats. I mean, some advanced stats mostly. But yeah, probably really. I mean, he had such a low ERA, and, and at right. the end of the day. He also, I mean, yeah, he just let in so such fewer runs, uh, had just under a six K to walk ratio. I mean, yeah, it was it was yeah. it was a and, phenomenal and, and, season. 
I did see an interesting point about um, the, the girl who runs his marketing, Morgan Plank, I believe is her name. Um, somebody had tweeted that like, you know, he wasn't even the top five or whatever, uh, but that his like marketing presence may have played a role. So I, I did I think, think I saw that, yeah. like, I was like, you know, maybe like he, he was like yeah. got a ton of impressions and engagements on social media much more than any other year. Um, so maybe that plays into like getting a couple extra votes. Cause I, I do agree. Like, you know, 27, it was like, Oh, yeah. I didn't, I thought that he would win, but I didn't yeah. think it would be that commanding. Right. What does your season look like? Like, do you work with those guys like Bauer and, and like other big leaguers, uh, a good amount or how do you, uh, are you only kind of working with guys that you're in person with? Yeah. So it was, uh, obviously a very unique year. Yeah. Um, I was fortunate enough to be at the alternate site, uh, Prasco Park, working with the players who were considered taxi squad. So a, a large chunk of these guys were major league depth and, and a large chunk of them did go and, and get innings in major league games. Um, and there was also some prospects sprinkled in. So it was sort of where we were housing again, you know, uh, all of our alternate site players. Um, but, but so there is, I guess, some direct involvement with people who are contributing to the game. Um, uh, but what was a really cool part for me was we would practice in the early afternoon to, to early evening, and I'd be able to rush over to the stadium afterwards and sit and watch the game with Caleb, um, and, and things like that. So to take in the, the games and be able to watch some sort of like direct contribution stuff was really cool, uh, to watch guys who had to be out of competition and just playing, red jerseys every day, yeah. uh, get their opportunity to go play in, in the major leagues was really, really cool and rewarding. Um, and then to be able to learn and just kind of be a fly on the wall to, to conversations that Caleb would have with um, or, or one of our advanced coaches, uh, Christian Perez was in there as well. So just to listen to conversations those guys have and, and learn the game and watch the game um, was really cool. So I guess to answer your question, yeah, most of the work took place at the alternate site. Um, but I would be able to bounce over to the big league side as well um, and, and kind of take some of that stuff in. As someone who who rides the fine line, like probably more than anybody else um, between, between R and D and kind of like skill coaching. How, how is that like for, from your perspective, what's, what's kind of, what kind of, what would people like not think about when it comes to incorporating R and D advice and then obviously applying it on the field and also dealing with maybe the, the player's viewpoint, the entrenched coach's viewpoint, and then also, you know, you're, you're, you're working for a team whose number one goal is to win, not mm -hmm. always necessarily develop the, you know, X player in the bullpens, third pitch, this amount. So how, how has that fine line kind of been? Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's right. And it's like, you know, it's it's like the optimal pitch mix or optimal pitch frequency. It's like, yeah, we would have everyone have, you know, Bowers arsenal and make it even better um, for every pitcher, right? Like in, in theory, yeah. but it's like, that's just not feasible and doesn't work at all. So I, I think that's maybe where it is, is like the, the relationship side of, of knowing who these players are, what their capabilities are, and then how we can disseminate this information, um, to them and apply it, uh, so that they are able to, to, you know, play at the highest level they possibly can right now. Um, but then kind of like you said, separating the the training and competition to where, yeah, we're always trying to get better, but like there comes a time where the rubber meets the road and like, I've got to get this guy out with what I've got. And, you know, my best kind of has to be good enough right now. Um, so I, I guess that's sort of the fine line that we do walk. Um, and, and that's just really any coach or trainer is just kind of knowing the guy and, and knowing the time um, and then be able to, to apply those things. But I think, um, Another thing is like knowing, knowing my role and my skill level. So, um, you know, knowing that I'm not a, a data scientist, I'm, I'm not an analyst and needing to fact check myself. So leaning on resources with the Reds, um, our analysts there and leaning on analysts at driveline as well. I can't tell you how many, you know, questions or conversations that I've had with, with all you guys, uh, with Dan, of uh, just kind of like fact checking myself. And it's, you know, maybe I, I think something, but need a little bit of a sanity check of, Hey, I think this is a really good idea for a stat. Like, you know, what am I missing or tell me why this isn't right. Um, so that's, that's kind of where it is for me is like knowing what my capabilities are and what my skill set is and then what other people's skill sets are and how they can, uh, aid my efforts as well. And then ultimately, you know, help the player as best as possible. 
what would you how, say? How has been? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna say like because uh, we were talking to Oach uh, on the last episode, mm-hmm. and um, you know, talking about the transition from like working with people at drive line in that environment to like, you know, uh, pro ball, it kind of goes along with caravan's question, but you, I mean, you've done this for two years now, uh, with the split deals. So like, is, is there like a large transition from like being able to work with someone at the lab, you know, doing pitch design in four, three compared to mm-hmm. like talking with a guy who's got like a game in 20 minutes, you know, mm-hmm. like, is mm-hmm. it a pretty pretty big difference in terms of like goals, mindset, like athletes' intentions, and also what you have to do as like a coach working with them? Yeah, no, it's an interesting question. It certainly is different, um, and I think when you are in the the midst of the off season, your your goals are a little bit different, and you do have a little bit more time to to be internally focused and and be. Um, you know, it, whether it be you're working on something with your delivery or you're working with something out of your hand or whatever, um, as opposed to more execution based where you're working on landing a pitch or you're working yeah. on figuring out how to get a, a certain uh, type of hitter out or whatever it may be. Um, but I think those things sort of coexist as well. You know, there might be a time in the season where you're, you do lose your slider and like, yeah, you have a game in 20 minutes, but we had about 10 reps right now in the bullpen to try and get it dialed in yeah, or, yeah. you know, something mechanically is awry. Um, and we're getting a report back that's, that's flagging X, Y, Z. And like, we do need to spend time in the throwing program. We do need to spend time in the bullpen working on these things. Uh, it just may be a little bit <clears throat> less intensive and we may know that we we've got this game, um, you know, sort of, uh, coming up quickly. Um, so I, I does that answer it? Yeah. Yeah, no, I was just, and I was also interested, like, so you've been able to like see different levels of pro ball. Is there like in your mind, is there, is there a huge gap between certain levels and like which level has the biggest gap? And is mm-hmm. it like, you know, some like intangible thing or, or harder to quantify thing like command or something or like, mm-hmm. w- was there anything that you noticed when you got into pro ball that was like, oh shit, like this is different kind of a thing? Yeah, yeah. And and it's worth saying that like, yeah, I'm two years in, one of the years there wasn't a whole lot of games and there's some lifers that that have 40, 40 plus years that, um, yeah. you know, have a much better idea of this than I do. But I do think I had an appreciation for how different the game is at the AAA level versus at the low A level. Um, and the things that you can sort of get away with as a pitcher or even as a hitter um, that you you can't get away with and that gets exposed at the higher levels. Um, it's a it's a for me, it's a more polished game uh, as you increase levels. It's a little bit faster game, um, things like that. I, I do think that um, like I think we saw this this year, too, where there's a lot of individuals who had their debut who only had experience in, in high A, um, things like that 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 held their own you know in the major leagues so i think that stuff plays and you see that at every level um that that stuff really really does play um but but that maybe you don't get away with as much i think that's what's uh, kind of stuck out to me the most interesting how did you so since the it seemed like the minor leagues and just like the organization in general was kind of downsized not everybody was active Mm -hmm. for the organizations playing games how did you, for the people who were still like training, still with the organization, how did you mm-hmm. kind of help them uh, use the, like use this time to the best of their advantage? Because for a lot of people, they looked at this season as like, this is unprecedented player development time. This is like a very, very long off season where you can make a lot of progress. And then the, I think there's maybe a couple different other perspectives, but how did you guys kind of use that and approach that with the, with the players who weren't, weren't so active with, in gameplay? Yeah. And I mean, even for the ones who were active, right, they had a pretty significant amount of downtime from mid-March to like whatever it was late, late uh, June before heading out to the either the alternate side or big league camp. So I, I think it was really important for all those guys is like, number one, all of you, like you have to stay ready. We don't know what's going to happen. It's a very fluid situation. Yeah. That's not just in sports, but that's like in general is, you know, there's news that changes everything, um, you know, on a daily basis uh, that we have to be ready for. So we have to be super adaptable. And for, for us, that meant just stay ready, stay ready. Like early on, it was okay. It's going to be two weeks. And after that, it was, 
okay, we're looking at maybe like a May start. After that, it was when there's talk in the minor leagues getting canceled, but we're not sure yet. And when we're hearing these things, I think we were making sure not to keep blind faith that like, hey, you guys are going to get to play. We, we were straight with guys and it's like, hey, look, we don't know. But if we if we do end up playing, we do know that we yeah. better be ready. So I think Kyle did a really good job being stern early on with like, regardless of the situation, we have to say glass half full, what can we do? Like, of course you guys are without facilities, you're without your normal equipment, you're without maybe a catcher, a catch partner, but what can you do? What can you do to stay ready? Um, and I think what we tried to do there to, was give these guys tools um, to stay in contact. So it was, you know, making a adjustment to create a Slack workspace for all of our players uh, to be involved, dividing them into teams, letting these guys know that we want to stay in contact, not just with your coaches, but with your players. And this is a community. This is a family. We want the Reds to stick together. We want you guys to show off what your workouts are and just push each other. Yeah. So we had some players who really stepped up and, and were really consistent with posting exactly what they were doing on a daily basis. Uh, guys who had the opportunity to have access to, to radar guns for posting their velocity readings and things like that. Um, and I think it was kind of a, a, a pulling from the bottom and then leading from the front as well of just like, hey, like I'm training. Are you, you know, and, and it, it created a really good environment for those guys to work. So I uh, did that and, and leveraged uh, YouTube. We put together, nice. I, I want to say it was like 200 plus videos, be that you know, drill explainers or remote coaching or um, big league examples of like edratronic footage, mechanics footage for these guys to learn from um, and then use at their disposal. So it was kind of like, hey, guys, like here's links to all these playlists. Um, you know, here's a edratronic playlist of, of every slider on the big league team, like go learn from it. And then we'd spend some time. Uh, we would do twice weekly Zoom calls of you know how exactly to do that it's not right. just give them this playlist and see what they do with it but it's like okay let's walk through it you know we can learn from this example here here's a, a lateral slider here's a gyroscopic slider you know find out who you are and how this applies to you and you don't have to have this exact pitch but can you learn something from it yeah. can you can you work in the certain or the right direction uh those kind of a things so um i think that's kind of what we did on the remote side and we're really fortunate to have some involvement from the major league staff and players as well um, during the Zoom calls. So we we're fortunate enough to have Sonny Gray, to have Trevor, to have uh, Michael Lorenzen uh, come on and, and speak to these guys. Um, and, and it was a really cool thing to be connected and to have those guys know that the messages that we're preaching uh, are the same that the big league staff is preaching. And the way that those guys think and talk the game is the same as, as kind of what we're trying nice. to, to do on the minor league side. So that was a really cool thing too. And, um, you know, we owe a lot to, to those guys, to Sonny and Mike and Trevor who, who really led the charge. Wow. Trevor gets a lot of uh, media coverage or maybe a lot of like almost self media coverage on being super helpful and being a huge resource for, for pitchers that are kind of yeah. only now getting familiar with the, you know, the, 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 the fine tuning of pitch design or even, just interpreting technology, uh, yeah. Like having been there, is, is there anything you can kind of like shed light on there, or, or how does that look in a in a big league camp or overall organization level? Yeah, yeah. I think some of the stuff early on was maybe not as positive, um, and and I think it's because Trevor tends to kind of keep to himself, and um, and I think he's leaned into being more of a mentor as he's aged, and maybe dishing out help without being specifically asked to do so. Um, but, but as the sort of training methodologies from driveline and, and other facilities that do great work have become more popularized and, and players are taking on, um, sort of different, uh, non-traditional training programs that they are more curious. And with Trevor being the pioneer, he is, uh, they're, they're more open to asking for advice or questions and things like that. Yeah but he's always, always been an open book. If you were to ask Trevor a question, he's going to give you a very detailed thought out answer. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it, it may be early on just wasn't, I am going to like go out of my way to, to tell you how to train because he also respects, you know, what guys have done and, and what got them, right? A lot of these players got themselves to the major leagues or got right. help from, from coaches to make it. Um, so it was not, I'm going to force my plan on you. 
But, you know, when guys are struggling and whatever else and they're curious, I think Trevor's always been been willing to, to lend a helping hand. Um, and yeah. now there's just more widely used uh, training methodologies that are similar to his. So it, it get, does get a bit more publicity on, on that realm. But I, I know firsthand, like a lot of those guys, the Reds, I'm, I'm sure you guys did interviews with TJ Antone, giving him a ton of credit. Yeah. And, and I know he did. And, and Trevor is huge for him. I, I think. TJ said he watched a game with Trevor um, just from the dugout and like learned. He's like, I learned more than I learned in the last two years. Like this yeah, guy's yeah. incredible. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, really cool. But I, I think for me, you know, that's, that's kind of always been the case and and Trevor's always been open and up front and, and willing to have a uh, really good conversations. Because he's, he's so willing to, to help out and to kind of teach, provide information, education, to other people. Do you think that his, like winning the Cy Young and obviously he's had a successful like bout in the big leagues, even before he, he won the, won the Cy Young. But uh, do you think the Cy Young like kind of helps him, like maybe he gets more players to be more willing to like take that, take advantage of that. Like maybe gets more buy-in from minor leaguers or gets more buy-in from other high school guys that want to uh, look at his YouTube videos or something like that. Do you think that expands his reach at all? I do. I think there's a quote. Um, I think Kyle had it as a pin tweet for a bit. It was like, all it takes is like, I need to win the Cy Young. And, and I think that's, that's true to a certain extent. I mean, it is the pinnacle. Um, so for, for him to do that is the ultimate like proof of the pudding, um, you know, that the, the methods to the madness are in fact, you know, what they are and, and that the, the stuff does work if you will. Um, now, you know, I think people can point to, to Trevor being a third overall pick and, and winning the golden spikes and that he's always been good and things like that. But, yeah. um, you know, I, I think if you, if you truly know him, um, and know the path that he's gone, right. That, you know, that he's revamped his entire delivery, um, that his command is, is much superior than it's ever been all these things. You can really appreciate that. Um, if you do know who he is and I think he does a really good job putting out a ton of content right on the on the vlog um on momentum's youtube things like that 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 you could argue the social media presence and the content creation that he's done might be even more far-reaching than than more winning yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so i think it's a huge kudos to the team that he's got in the work that they've done i can't tell you how many kids are, are watching that stuff and, and consuming that information. Right. And like, I, I remember very specifically uh, a picture we had with the Phillies in 2019, uh, gained like 10 inches of horizontal break on a slider because he heard Trevor talk at the all-star game about a slider grip and was like, Oh, uh, I'm going to try that. And then all of a sudden it was just like, this thing's wipe out. Yeah, and yeah. so you, you have such far reach and you're, you're touching a very skilled audience, right. Of, with some of these guys, um, same thing as like pitching ninjas channel, right? When, uh, I forget the, the pitcher with the athletics sees a slider grip or asks pitching ninjas question. He's like, Hey, what's that slider grip? Oh, all right. Goes, throws it. And it's like Rob's tweeting out the videos of him using the grip in a game, striking people out and whatever. Yeah. Um, so I think the, the, the like growth of social media has been uh, just as huge, but obviously it's highlighted by him winning. Yes. Right. Right. I, I was gonna say another, another kind of very open-ended question. It can be, you can make it as juicy as you want in terms of answering it, but someone who've named Trump a couple times, and I'm assuming most of the listeners know Kyle Bodie, uh, all our bosses, who is also um, is also a pitching coordinator with the Reds, uh, similar type of split deal setup as you, uh, and you know Bodie's a well-known figure in the baseball community in the Saber metrics community. I think he just made a 50 for 50 by Saber. How and a lot of people I think had opinions on him going to Pro Bowl. Maybe some people had were more hyped about it than others. Uh, like, what would what, you think? What surprised you the most about Bodie's kind of immersion in Pro Bowl? Because I mean, we, we all know Bodie has some strong opinions and and, and mm-hmm. like is definitely a man to stick by his guns and believes very strongly in you know the things he believes strongly in, which have held him up very well throughout his career. So, mm-hmm. what uh, what was your impression working right by beside him for the first time in Pro Bowl? Yeah. Yeah. I would say, I guess my impression or experience and what I think most people may be surprised about is his willingness to, to ask questions and to learn, um, as opposed to just, I know everything and this is the system that I'm going to run. Um, Kyle knows that he, he had a lot of blind spots and, and a lack of experience in the game and that there was a lot of staff that had a ton of experience in the game that he was going to need to lean on. So I think, and that was even surprising for, for some of the staff that I think he dealt with was him asking questions about, 
okay, well, you know, what, what should the, the pitchers do here or, or how often should we be practicing this certain thing um, to where it's, it's outside of his realm, right. Or the yeah. things that he does really well. Um, so I would guess, I guess that's sort of like a, I thought he did a really good job of displaying humility and, and um, you know, leaning on those with experience to help him out and get the most out of these guys where it would have been really easy to be like, Hey, yeah, I'm this, I'm this mastermind genius. Uh, I run driveline. So you're not going to tell me anything. I want to run these pitchers exactly how I want. And he could have done that. And it probably would have been pretty successful still, but we wouldn't have been able to maximize um, you know, the, the, these guys to the fullest extent. So right. that's, that's what I would have. And I think people would be surprised about how much of a traditionalist Kyle really is um, because he enjoys the the beauty of baseball, um, yeah. you know, and being on a field in the camaraderie of the game. Uh, it's, it's not just sitting and typing on a computer and you're just, I feel like people think he's like just writing code uh, for like 15 hours a day yeah. and like, he hits like enter and all the all the stuff that he wants to happen just like goes. <laughs> That's yeah. only when he's counting white claw and between hours of midnight and three a.m. Yeah, yeah. Just... yeah. <laughs> he's late night white yeah, claws. But, no, he's he's. A, I think he would tell you that he's you know a, a purist for the game and and really does love and appreciate the game of baseball. Mm. And I think I saw that out of him, man. Like for it just goes out to the field and he's super fired up to be there. Um, you know, it always brings out a speaker for the guys to play catch with and and enjoying just the, the whole experience of it all. So, yeah. Uh, kind of, kind of some, some fun questions near the end or, or, I mean, trust me, Jake's not as personal as, as, uh, <laughs> as we got on Oates podcast, but, but I was going to say, uh, especially with the crazy season, what, 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 what did you do to like, how, how was your kind of fitness schedule and, and, uh, how easy it is, is it like staying in shape and eating, eating healthy throughout the season? Cause I know, I know you're a man who, who cares about those things. Yeah. I, I think from like the, uh, working out perspective, we, we were able to use the facilities just prior to players getting there. Um, so the, the strength staff was super accommodating for staff that they wanted to get workouts in, um, fairly easy. So long as we were helping clean up and, and wipe things down and staying masked up, obviously, um, so really, really happy that they allowed us to kind of have those opportunities. And then from a nutrition standpoint, like I can't say enough, uh, huge shout out to Ashley and Leah with the reds who absolutely killed it for summer camp for the season and for instructional league, they made sure that we had the very best, um, and that we got exactly what we needed for our athletes to perform at their, their, um, you know, highest level. So it was, it was top notch and, and we would just basically have, catered food that we'd order through an app. So there was always multiple options to order, um, for lunch and dinner. And then it was just prepackaged and we'd have silverware in there. So much like if you were to get whatever, a delivery service, DoorDash or Uber Eats cheeseburgers. Or yeah. A lot of, a lot of that. No, but they, nice. they did a good job. Like, um, you know, mixing fun things in to eat as well. Um, you know, like we had, I know everybody loved the ribs that we got delivered, but they had snacks on deck all the time, um, nice. for guys to have and stay fueled up. So, um, yeah, it was a great mix of, of like taste and, and performance as well. So they did a, a great job with that. What so, pro player? Oh, sorry. Uh, I was gonna say what pro player has the craziest, uh, workouts and if it's not Lorenzen, I <laughs> definitely want to, I definitely want to hear more detail about it. Oh my goodness. Uh, I mean, this one for me is just easy cause it's on my mind, but it's, it's, it's Jesse Biddle. Uh, he's, he's currently a free agent, but he was with the reds and he was spending a good chunk of time at the alternate site. And I, this dude is a, he's ranked, I think internationally in rowing. Uh, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> crazy stuff. But, uh, I think he challenged me to do a, a certain amount of calories on the airdyne bike. And he said, Hey, like I did it for 30 minutes straight, uh, just 755 calories. And I was like, okay, that sounds like a lot. I, I didn't like ride the airdyne a lot. So I'm like, uh, I think, okay, let me do the math. Okay. I gotta get like, you know, 23, 24 a minute. All right. I'll like try that. I did it. And I, I got to 15 minutes and I wasn't even close to the pace. I want to say I was at like three fifteen, something like that. And I was like, okay, three fifteen times two. Oh gosh. Yeah. I'm no, no chance. Yeah. Like blew me out of the water. Uh, and, and he would send me challenges for rowing stuff. That was like the worst workouts that I have, I have ever done, um, that I would watch him do just with ease. Uh, so it was, it was quite depressing, but, but really to, to see like the numbers that you can put up, uh, is, is pretty crazy. And he's got like the number one for all the reds, like top rankings of like a 500 meter row. 
whatever, like something on the ski erg, uh, the airdyne hundred calorie right. challenge. Dude's just like at the top. Is so, he, do you guys have strength leaderboards too? Is he on top of those as well? Yeah, I, I don't think there's, I haven't seen those at least like publicly um, for, for where he'd rank, but I would imagine it'd be pretty good. Uh, yeah. I, I do like to say though that like, I mean, he weighs substantially more than me. He's got a very biomechanically efficient body when it comes to <laughs> rowing. So if he's listening, I hope that he knows I'm not just <laughs> blowing him up. Uh, it, it pays to be a much larger individual, which he would just tell me like, well, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm just the bet, I'm better at it. Like, <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> I saw early on in, in the kind of shutdown period, you were getting back to, I didn't know this about you. I also just learned that you were a skateboarder too, but uh, you I mean, were- was, do- dude, this guy, this guy is skateboarding the driveline every day. <laughs> You were doing a bunch of uh, soccer juggling. Is that something that you kept up throughout the summer? Or do you not really have time for that? And did you hit any, hit any other hobbies? Like I know uh, you were spending time with Rob. He, he's mm-hmm. a big Kendama guy. So I don't yeah. know if you, you got into that or at all. Yeah, no, I think I think that was a product, uh, the soccer juggling of, of just being very bored over the quarantine period. And, and I was watching actually uh, All or Nothing, a Amazon Prime documentary on um, Manchester City. And I had just, I'm, I'm a fan of the English Premier League. So I was just like, oh, I'm going to a soccer ball. So I got one and, and it was just something I would kind of either use as like a warm up for a workout or just kill some time in the, in the backyard uh, over stuff. the quarantine period. Yeah, exactly. So, but I do love soccer. I played in high school. I love watching it. Um, I think it's a fun game. So it was just something to like, you know, be a little bit of a hobby. Um, Dude, and you were going ham on backflips. I remember uh, Jake sent me a video of, of him doing like a double backflip or something, and, and, but the video didn't load the first time. So he just sent me this video and I clicked on it and it was 20 seconds of, of just black, both like some background noise. And I was like, cool, cool, cool man. Uh, what am I supposed to be looking at? And he's like, not even impressed at all. Like, dude, the video didn't load. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was going to say really quickly, uh, do, do we have any questions from the chat at all, Brady? I don't know if you're keeping an eye on that. Uh, no no questions in the chat. Although uh, I do have a very pressing question, which, which someone has reached out to me about. Um, what what kind of offer will it take for Trevor to sign with the studs next year? <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think if they can offer him to pitch every, every fourth day and make a competitive <laughs> offer – uh, you know, relative to these MLB teams, you've okay. got a shot. He said that he's open to anything. He said that he's open to Japan. He's open to the MPB. So I don't see why the Seattle studs could be ruled out either. Okay, that's good enough. Out to good. Rachel Luba. Good. I was going to yeah. say, I, I think I think if enough studs follow Rachel Luba, if, yeah. if more than 2% of, of uh, Luba's followers are studs, I'm pretty sure, I, I've been reading between the lines on our tweets, I'm pretty sure that means <laughs> Barry's going to sign up the studs. We can do that. We can pull that off. Yeah. Good to know. Good to know. Yeah, but I'll, I'll, I guess I'll touch on the uh, backflip. I think the story is grow legs every time that you say them, Caravan. I, I certainly didn't do a double backflip. I don't know where that. <laughs> I, I said that. I said that. I was wondering if you would correct me. Yeah, but but I do have a bit of a background in gymnastics. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have my my mom place me in gymnastics class when I was like five to seven years old. So just learning basic movements like a, a cartwheel, a round off, a back handspring, things like that. Uh, are actually super valuable and, and carried over pretty uh, like crazy down the line because I can still kind of do that stuff. But I had never done a, just a standing backflip. And I was fortunately in Southern California over the quarantine period. So I was on the beach and it was a, it was a pretty soft landing. If I was going to biff it, then I would land in sand anyway. Yeah. Uh, so I just kind of sent it and figured out that I could do a backflip. Smart. And I sent it to you to try and impress you. <laughs> Hope it worked. <laughs> Hope it worked. It, it worked, dude. <laughs> Hell yeah. Perfect. Well, uh, do you have any questions for us, Jiggers? You, it's usually how we, we end these bad boys off. Ooh, okay, yes. usually, by usually, Lindley means we asked Oshart that and he asks the fire question. <laughs> no, but dude, it's that, usually how we will that, end them. That was, mul- that was, that's been multiple interviews, bro. Don't call me out like that. Yeah, that's, a, right. that's a common, I, I that's do, a common guest. I'm going to have, I'm going to have a couple here. My first one is going to be, I walked into the driveline offices and I saw the sports science banner hanging and I I was made aware that the R&D department has branched off a little bit and there's now a sports science wing. Please, uh, please inform the crowd about that a little bit. 
Well, the sports science wing is one of three wings in R and D. Uh, it's being touted the best Who's the wing. Leader? Who's the uh, leader of the in R and D? It's it's blatantly the best wing uh, in R and D. So there's a sports science wing, and then I believe there's two others. Um, but yeah, that's where all the sports science goes down. So. No, I'm gonna name drop the other two, dog. I don't remember what they are. <laughs> I understand there's been uh, some title changes uh, as as the wing has has branched off. Bro, we haven't even talked about this internally yet, dude. <laughs> <laughs> We're still waiting on Joe to drop the base camp post. <laughs> All right, we'll we'll leave that one covered. Still up. to be determined. Uh, on the next episode, we'll divulge the org chart at Drive On Baseball. <laughs> Screech here. Perfect, perfect. And I, I, I want to know, uh, I guess just like if you each want to share one sort of like ongoing project, breadcrumb, something that, that people can be excited about. I think that's like my favorite part of coming back to Driveline is just, hey, what's going on? Like, what's the next frontier? What do we got? Um, and it's a question that I get asked pretty often as well of just like, hey, what's next? You know, like everybody's got access to the same information, I feel like is the hot sort of buzzword now. Uh, I would I would uh, argue otherwise, given the the individuals that I get to work with. Uh, so, what do you got, Anthony? Start with you. Well, to to be fair, I, w- I will say that uh, unfortunately, as of right now, the cooler things are still in the black ops phases. Uh, okay. So, like that's fine. Taboo on the podcast a little, but um, sure. just talking code, dude. Just talk all in code. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'll say that like. Uh, I mean, I've handed this mostly off to Lindley, who's working on a lot of it right now, but like version two of, of buckets is probably like the most exciting, mm-hmm. uh, thing that I think in the sports science wing. Um, mm-hmm. but also a little bit, of, a little bit of hitting, hitting biomechanics, um, getting that going, mm-hmm. helping, helping support Gretchen, uh, stand that up. But buckets V2 is, I mean, buckets was my baby and, and this one's got me excited. We got a, a couple other things going on, implementing uh, Modus wi- on a wide scale uh, just recently, which is really exciting. So we're going to see how that can kind of scale and how we can create uh, a good like large scale systems around that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also be on the lookout for, but I'm not making any guarantees or anything, obviously, um, but we're going to be submitting a couple of things to, to Sabre, oh, to the yeah. Sabre seminar. So mm. hopefully we can, we can get some presentations there and you guys should tune in. Yeah. Love that. Uh, one question, uh, follow up on the modus. I've seen you uh, referencing some sort of like different straps and things like that on Twitter. What can when we expect uh, that to sort of like roll out? Is there anything that you've found that's that's been really good? Yeah. So uh, this was actually suggested to us by when, when we acquired modus, but they have a tennis elbow sleeve that we uh, kind of heat press on a pocket too. And we've had guys use that and test it in gym and it's just way more stable and it, it doesn't move. It's way more comfortable. Guys, guys are much more happy with it and you just don't have to move it around every throw. Uh, like Anthony and it's I, really fire. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. Really fire. Uh, like during our, our, our bout with modus assessments in 2017, just like every like two throws, especially if the sleeve doesn't fit perfect, you got to adjust that thing, pull it up, like try to figure out how to make the sleeve fit on their arm. Um, and that shouldn't be a problem. So I, I don't know when it's going to happen. We're still kind of wor- trying to figure out logistics there, but um, right now we're just kind of buying them from a third party and we're going to figure out how we can get our own uh, going here in the next couple months, hopefully. Yeah. Sweet. And I never talked to my, um, uh... But I never laid any breadcrumbs. I mean, you you know you know the main project I'm working on is pretty Black Ops Jigs. But but I was gonna say something I can't talk about is one of the things that we kind of kicked around a, a bunch, but now have a little bit more more uh more horsepower in terms of the analysts that we have on board. So we're able to kind of take a lot of the recurring own like recurring work like the KPI reporting, data logging, building out like uh, consolidated reports for each of the departments. That's that's more dialed. So now I'm really excited about actually working on some uh, meteor data science projects, which is, uh, you know, it's a spoiler alert for one of the wings in uh, R&D. But uh, I, I think one of the cooler things that we're working on right now is constructing predicted velocities and bat speeds off other data sources, like mm-hmm. specifically force plate data, which we've only really gone standardized this year, but mm-hmm. are rapidly piling up like a pretty impressive database so I, I think that's super exciting and something that working on now and I expect to keep improving and iterating and, and really get a really keep 
really another kind of feather in the cap of our claim to a, having a, a full integrative training and ability to prioritize like specific training and not just, you know, group assigned athletes, specific templates and or general templates, but rather really, really hone in on moving deficiencies, all, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I actually think that's a, a cool point too, is like the assessment process. And then these sort of like branches off, like you just talked about finding correlations between the, you know, force place metrics and then bat speed or, or pitch velocity or whatever it may be is whenever, whatever, like the first standardized assessment wasn't perfect. And I'm sure people had things to say about, you know, why it wasn't all encompassing or whatever, but again, that's not the point. And I think that's the beauty of this place and why I love it so much is, is that we're, we're taking steps forward and we know that it's not perfect and we'll acknowledge that. And whatever we do find uh, from from that perspective won't be perfect either, and there will be missing pieces. Yeah. But we'll continually try to kind of piece this thing together, and it's this never-ending puzzle. Um, but if you if you get stalled out because it's not perfect, you know, and then you run into paralysis by analysis or whatever, that's where we like really run into issues. So um, you know, like I've I've said it once, and I'll say it again, but like you know, keep pushing it forward. I'm I'm really fortunate and happy to work with this group because. Um, you guys do an awesome job of, of making that stuff happen and continually pushing the game forward. Um, and, and we're all really fortunate to have that. So, Not as Thanks, fortunate James. as we are to have you on the podcast, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and to have you back for a couple months. Let's go, yeah, baby. Dude. That's right. Fucking fire. Let's go. Got, got, got to be beat up on you in poker too, so that was tight. Yeah, man. That was, that was not good. That was not good. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you you you, you uh. Ingebrecht wasn't playing any games, man. Oh, dude, no. you yeah, you you were trying to you were trying to hawk the the bullpen the bullpen app, dude. More <laughs> so than your chips, bro. No, you you hooked it up. I'm sorry I couldn't bring it home. I'm sorry I couldn't stay in the game more. Um, yeah. with the chips you, you threw at me. Yeah. No, that was that was that was even good. I, I hope we can get that game rolling. You know, the dice game. Um, oh yeah. Happen. I'm not sure how it'll work with limited capacity or whatever, but yeah. Not out. the dice game; it's a card game now. Anthony says, "Card game, card game." And, and, and we will live stream it to one of one lucky follower who likes uh, the last tweet I sent out. <laughs> Two giveaways, dude. Yeah, what's the uh, what's the retweet count at? Do you know? Uh, nope. I think I, I think when I last I saw it was at least like ten. So are we are we done? Pretty good odds. Twelve twelve retweets so far. Yeah, yeah. Well, 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 you better say some dirt. You better say some say some dirt, Jakes. I don't think we're yeah. yo. Yo, yo, we're still yo, recording. Don't, don't All right, everyone. Anymore. Thanks for uh, thanks for tuning into this episode of the uh, Drive on <laughs> R&D podcast. The next one will be uh, with guest uh, Trevor Bowers, personal assistant. Thank you, Green. <laughs> Come on, you guys can't do that. He's gonna be mad at me for gosh dang it. <laughs> that, that's, that's what Jake said. Not us. All right, see you guys later.